Well, I'd like to welcome all of you for to joining us and thank you for joining us from around the world. We are about to start the Faith and Regenerative uh, Economy, Doing Business for the Benefit of People and Planet, sponsored by the Plastic Bank. We're going to wait a few more minutes for the rest of our guests to show up. But while we're waiting, I'd like to just introduce our, our panelists here, our presenters. We are uh, very lucky and blessed to have Reverend Dr. Dave Bookless, who's joining us from London, England. We have Dr. Jose Ambrosic joining us from San Jose, Costa Rica. We have Joanne Green, also from London, England. And finally, we've got Dr. Peter Nitsch Nitschke, who is joining us from Germany. So we'll just take a few moments here and allow a few more attendees to join. Okay, are you seeing the, uh, the graphic on how to ask questions? Yes. Yes. Well, while we're waiting, Peter, do you want to maybe share a little bit about uh, Plastic Bank and uh, the FAITH program, just to give a little bit of an overview as, as folks are still filing in? Actually, that would be part of my <laughs> um, your presentation. presentation. But, um, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, a, it is a second webinar that Plastic Bank is, is hosting. The first one was uh, more also about um, ocean uh, and theology on on taking care of, of creation. And then it was basically the launching event of the faith program of Plastic Bank, which was launched last September 2019. In the moment, we are engaging congregations in the Philippines in Indonesia, in Brazil, um, and in Germany, and it has been a very interesting journey to, to see that uh, when we come together, we can do a difference, and what combines all of us is that we are using plastic, so we all also have a responsibility to take care of it, and um, I think that Plastic Bank as a social enterprise is one of the very few uh, organizations that has uh, that is uh, engaging different stakeholders worldwide. <laughs> Not only faith congregation, but also schools, businesses, and, and uh, so we are very glad also for our presenters today who come from different organizations and different. Uh, Christian, Christian traditions uh, to present today. Thank you, Peter. And while we're just waiting another minute or two as attendees continue to filter in, I'd like to uh, just draw your attention to the graphic I have on the screen here. We will be entertaining questions at the end of the webinar. And uh, the best way for your question to be asked is uh, for those of you who are not familiar with GoToMeeting, on the right-hand side, you can find uh, a menu bar. And um, there you'll see a category called questions. If you click that little uh, arrow there, it'll open up and you'll be able to type in your question. And what I'll be doing is monitoring the questions as the presentations um, are unfolding and recording those questions and moderating those questions at the end of the presentations, please direct if you have a specific question to one of our presenters, um, just write in the question, this question is for such and such presenter, and I'll try to order those questions appropriately. I see we have about 50 attendees right now. So what I'd like to do, and we're about five minutes in, I wanna respect everybody's time. Again, I wanna welcome you to our webinar, The Faith and a Regenerative Economy, Doing Business for the Benefit of People and Planet. And as Peter uh, mentioned, this is our second uh, faith-based webinar for uh, sponsored by Plastic Bank. 
and we'll get into a little bit more specifics towards the end of the webinar about Plastic Bank, about uh, the FAITH program, and what we are working on around the world to become better stewards of creation, to care for our oceans, to uh, enliven and engage the impoverished and help pull them out of poverty, and to do so in a meaningful way which returns their dignity to them, which activates them as uh, stewards as well of the economy, uh, of, of the economy and of creation. And so uh, in the next uh, hour or so, we have the blessing of being joined by four experts in this area. Um, we will have presentations starting by uh, Reverend Dr. Dave Buchlis, who's joining us in London, England. Uh, Dr. Jose Ambrosic joining us from Costa Rica. Joanne Green also joining us uh, down the way from uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Dave here in uh, London, England. And then finally, Peter Nitschke in Germany. And so we'll be starting off um, the webinar here with Reverend Dave, uh, Reverend Dr. Dave Buchlis. Dave, uh, Reverend Dave is uh, a director of theology for uh, Rocha International, an international uh, Christian nature conservation organization. He is also vicar of St. Mary's Norwood Green in South Hall, London, and a member of Church of England's Environmental Working Group. In addition, Dave is a global catalyst for creation care with the Lusana movement and recently completed a PhD in theology and biodiversity conservation at Cambridge University. Born in India, Dave and his family have lived in multi-faith South Hall since 1991. He has spoken and lectured on environmental issues across six continents and has contributed to over 20 books, including, including PlantWise, which has been translated into Chinese, Dutch, French, German, and Spanish, and God Doesn't Do Waste. To relax, he enjoys wildlife, running, mountain walking, and Indian food. His presentation today will focus on sharing economic lessons and drawing from the current COVID-19 crisis by giving a biblical vision of flourishing that works for people and planet together. Dr. Dave, thank you for joining us. I want to speak to the topic, can humans flourish without destroying nature? A vision for putting the economy in its place. When this seminar was planned, the subject of a regenerative economy, doing business for people and planet was already crucial. The climate crisis, ecosystem collapse and biodiversity loss, oceans of plastic waste and the reality of a rich minority over consuming Earth's finite, right, finite resource, resources at the expense of the poor majority, all of these made the subject critical. Three years ago, I spoke in Hong Kong and China on a very similar topic. Can we have abundant life without trashing the planet? I began by defining what we usually mean by abundant life or human flourishing. After all, isn't the purpose of an economy to enable us all to flourish? And here's exactly what I listed as the popular idea of abundant life, health, wealth, possessions, security, freedom, mobility. How things have changed in a few short weeks. Our mobility, freedom and security have all disappeared for now. Our health, particularly the most vulnerable of us, is under threat from a tiny, almost invisible virus. Our wealth and pension security, certainly if invested in stocks and shares, have plummeted. Our possessions suddenly seem less important and those temples of consumerism, the shopping malls and superstores, have closed except for essential items, all because of one almost invisible virus. What this allows us amidst the very real fear, grief and worry is a positive opportunity to rethink exactly what it means for humans to flourish and for our economic system to be regenerative and restorative rather than unstable, unjust, exploitative and unsustainable. We're already seeing a resetting of people's values 
Alongside the selfish food hoarders, we're seeing many offering to help their neighbors. Before the UK's lockdown, we saw people flocking to parks, beaches, mountains, and wild places, sensing a need for nature and the outdoors. People overcoming isolation by creating online communities, virtual parties. Young people turning off TV to play old fashioned board games. Some people asking existential questions about the purpose of their lives and the priorities they've been chasing. None of the things I have just mentioned contribute to economic growth. And that just shows what a narrow and poor measure of human flourishing GDP is. I have a profound sense that in this time of economic collapse, alongside very real hardships, people are learning how to flourish in whole new ways. More than 50 years ago, Bobby Kennedy said these words, we seemed to have surrendered personal excellence and community values in the mere accumulation of material things. Our gross national product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising, ambulances to clear our highways of carnage, it counts special locks for our doors and the jails for the people who break them. It counts the destruction of the redwood and the loss of our natural wonder in chaotic sprawl. It counts television programs which glorify violence in order to sell toys to our children. Yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages the intelligence of our public debate or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. So what kind of economy do we want to allow people to truly flourish? Here are four headlines. Firstly, we need an economy that takes nature seriously. COVID-19 is a crisis for human health and for economics, but its causes are environmental. It began with the transmission of pathogens from animals to humans, like SARS, MERS, Ebola, West Nile, and so many others. We cannot afford to mess with nature like this. And because our current global economic system sees profit as always good and the environment as simply an externality, it bizarrely and dangerously sees the multi-billion dollar illegal trade in wildlife parks as an economic good. We need an economy that properly accounts for environmental damage and risks, that penalizes whatever damages nature's flourishing, or else you can be sure more and worse global pathogens will emerge. Secondly, we need an economy that works for people and planet. There is a false view that we have to make a choice between what works for humanity and what works for nature. It's a short-sighted and dangerous view. It often confuses what works for people with what works for the market. And you see the market failed to anticipate or deal with COVID-19. Globalized travel and trade led directly to it spreading rapidly and globally. But with factories closed and planes grounded, polluted skies are clearing. CO2 and particulate levels are dropping. Bird song is heard again in Wuhan and fish have been observed in the canals of Venice. An economic system that concentrates wealth in the hands of a few and widens the gap between rich and poor is not only unjust, but leads to unhappiness, suffering and alienation for both rich and poor. An economic system that pollutes skies, oceans and soil ultimately destroys the possibility of flourishing for people as well as for nature. In our work in Arosha, across six continents and over nearly 40 years, we have massive experience of practical projects that work both for people and biodiversity. We know and we've shown that it can work. Thirdly, we need an economy that learns from natural systems. In nature, there is no pollution. Everything gets reused, recycled, turned back into productive fruitfulness. Waste is a product of linear economies. We take, we use, we discard. There are natural rhythms that we ignore at our peril. The only things in nature that grow without resting are cancers and viruses. The earth is perhaps reminding us that now with an enforced rest, a season of jubilee for the earth, 
there can be a pause for thought and renewal. A regenerative and restorative economy has to be a circular economy where nothing is disposable and all single use items are recyclable or biodegradable. That's how nature works. We need to move urgently and rapidly away from reliance on extractive and exploitative industries that take without putting back. The current crisis reminds us that we are all together in this, citizens of what Pope Francis rightly calls our common home. Finally, we need a vision of the good life, of a world where economies serve people and planet without exploiting, dividing, polluting and destroying. So far, I haven't explicitly mentioned God or the Bible, but all I've said has been rooted in a biblical vision of God's purposes for his world. The biblical term that sums up that vision is shalom, which means not only peace, but well-being, restored and harmonious relationships with God, with ourselves, with our neighbors locally and globally, and with God's creation, four dimensions. It's a vision that underlies what I'm told is now the most quoted verse in the Bible on social media, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. It's a vision of prospering, which in biblical terms is not narrowly economic, but relational. Just before Jeremiah 29, 11, in verses five to seven, the meaning of what prospering really is is spelled out in instructions to people in exile in Babylon to invest ecologically, planting gardens and eat what, eating what they produce, to invest socially in family life, to invest politically and economically in working for the shalom and well being of the city, and investing spiritually in praying for its welfare. As we seek to learn something positive from the plague of COVID 19, may this be our vision too a world of shalom for people and planet, as we learn to live well within the limits of our common home. Um, insightful presentation, extremely relevant to what we're living today. And uh, while you were disconnected, I was sharing with, uh, with the attendees, um, I've got a, quite a few questions here for you. Um, I'm thinking about my own uh, situation in the last uh, 10 to 12 days of how in quarantine, how I've challenged this idea of abundant living very practically and in, in how I'm living right now. So look forward to hearing questions from folks on your presentation and asking a few myself towards the end of the webinar. Now I'd like to go to uh, Dr. Jose Ambrosic, who I was just previously introducing his presentation will focus on how human ecology helps to reframe work, business, and markets to embrace the golden rule as a guiding principle so as to foster authentic human flourishing within a sustainable environment. Dr. Jose. Okay. Thank you, uh, Ryan. So, um, talking about the Catholic-inspired human ecology and how can it be helpful for people in nature? A frequent contradiction is argued between business and social responsibility. It poses a trade-off between business activity and economic growth on one side and well-being of people and the environment on the other. Naturally, there are, there are grounds to argue this way. Milton Friedman famously proclaimed that the only purpose of business is to maximize the wealth of its shareholders and that any action intended towards social responsibility is undue taxation of shareholders and usurps the role of the government. Businesses, therefore, have no limits other than the law, and not even that, given that sometimes a cost-benefit analysis will support breaking the law. Certainly, any ethical consideration is considered to unjustly force on the business personal moral beliefs, which should be kept private. Many religious traditions, as well as some secular positions, argue otherwise, in the sense that business as part of society cannot ignore social and environmental responsibilities. Popes John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and Francis have consistently affirmed that all human action, including those in business and the market, are subject to moral discernment and moral responsibility. 
We've also proposed reintroducing the concept of gift reciprocity, the universal destination of goods, and the common good into economy and business. What is right or wrong? What is appropriate and healthy for the human person? Human ecology seeks to propose the best environment for the flourishing of the human person. What is healthy? What responds to human needs? A study has gone on for more than 80 years at Harvard University exploring what makes people happy. The very clear conclusion is that what makes people happy is having significant relationships. People in your life that you love, care for, and trust, and who love you back as well. Not wealth, education, success, fame, or health. Another study by Paul Piff and other psychologists at Stanford shows that being or feeling wealthy significantly increases your likelihood of being mean and prideful, lacking compassion and generosity, lying, cheating, and being disrespectful of the rights and needs of others, thus having attitudes that undermine authentic relationships, which are the real source of happiness. Being wealthy, then, doesn't improve, but rather lessens your probability of being happy, which is totally contrary to what our culture and social environment tells us. In another issue, Maslow tells us that people that have not satisfied their basic needs can never aspire to fulfill their higher expectations, thus condemning the bottom billions to abandon hope of a fulfilling spiritual life. The work of Viktor Frankl absolutely contradicts that, but Maslow's mistaken approach is the one that prevails in public policy. Humans are made for love and purpose, but the view promoted by society is that of base self-interest and materialism, breeding loneliness, distrust, and a spiritual void. The real nature of the human person must guide human activity and work. It will have the purpose primarily of satisfying my own needs and the needs of those I care for, but also the purpose or meaning of creating value, be it goods, art, experience, joy, or satisfaction. Creating value for myself and for the service of others, for doing good, for expressing love, each person can contribute with her skills to the needs of others in society. Doctors will heal. Carpenters will produce tables and chairs. Musicians will raise their spirits. Farmers will provide food. Apple would produce iPods and iPhones, and Amazon will deliver them to our doors, each one taking pride in the goods and services they provide. Economic compensation will be received in exchange, but the primary purpose of work is serving the needs of others. Vision and mission statements of businesses are never about making money, but rather about the role of service they aim to play in society. Economies and markets as well will fulfill their role, allocating goods and resources efficiently for the needs of all the population. The Italian economist, Luigino Bruni, recognizes the value of markets in the price signals that help allocate resources efficiently, but also what he calls the immunitas they provide. Simply put, immunitas shields us from preference or discrimination, ensuring that a fair exchange of value is achieved between actors in the market, regardless of their wealth, social standing, race, or any other personal trait. Even if markets achieve this practical purpose, it is not enough. Human interaction requires more than financial equity in transactions. The indifference of immunitas hurts. Apart from transactions through technological interfaces that do not involve other people, a human person in every human encounter expects respect, goodwill, and trust. Thus, the need of reintroducing gift and reciprocity to market transactions. This human dimension is present in the current trend to look out for the interests not only of shareholders, but of all stakeholders in the firm. Consultants accurately state this will help the bottom line on the long term, but we may also find its roots in common decency of the golden rule. Treat others as you wish to be treated by them. 
or in the expression more common to Christian cultures, love your neighbor as you love yourself. If we follow this approach, the neighbor I'm supposed to love is my shareholder, my boss, my partner, my coworker or employee, my supplier, my customer, or anyone affected by my work or business activity. I will res respect them and seek their good. I will not deceive my boss or shareholder. I will not take advantage of my supplier. I would not sell faulty goods or at an excessive price to my customer. I will not deny my customers of the best product or service I can reasonably provide. I will not shield myself in laws or regulations to deny just redress to any of them. This expresses the love and respect to each as I myself would like to be treated. It allows me to pursue honesty, integrity, satisfaction and pride in my work and a conscience that is at peace. It also engenders trust and goodwill, which in the long run has been proof once and again to be the hallmark of outstandingly successful businesses. An interesting example is some versions of design thinking, which focus on understanding the customer needs so that products can be designed to satisfy those real needs at prices they can afford. This is very different from marketing as a tool to get people to buy the product they have in stock, regardless of whether they need it or not. This ethical approach that puts the well being of all above profit and self interest is the healthier path, generating goodwill and trust. It also helps in consuming only the resources required to provide for the real needs of people. It cannot be forced, it has to be inspired to others and embraced freely. However, we might have more pressing incentives in the near future. The consequences of our dysfunctional economies will be unavoidable and will force us to change our errant ways. The blind push for economic growth in which we are engaged in a global dimension, regardless of its nature and consequences, is unsustainable. More and more it shows to be against nature and ultimately suicidal. We are living the ultimate tragedy of the commons. Following the logic of market and rational self-interest, the competition for financial gains, growth and profit is depleting resources and destroying society and nature. Economic growth consumes renewable and non-renewable resources at the rate that cannot be sustained. It burns more fuel to produce energy for manufacturing, multiplying emissions, it forces people to buy goods and services they don't need, running up unsustainable debt. It multiplies discarded goods and waste, poisoning nature and our food supply. The irrational way we address this issue shows our blind belief that material prosperity and abundance will deliver salvation. Repeatedly, we conclude that the lifestyles of the wealthier nations are unsustainably consuming resources and producing emissions and waste 40 to 60 times per capita that of poor populations, not to speak of the one per, top 1%. This demographic, which also holds the reins of financial and political power in the media, is not only unwilling to curb their harmful lifestyle, but they deceptively propose it as a model to poorer nations with the purpose of increasing its markets, not caring for the fact that the majority of people will never be able to achieve it and if they ever did, the planet would collapse. The World Bank, with convoluted reasoning, defends growth on the basis that it helps the poor and it's good for the environment. Through this, what trickles down to the poor is not only insufficient, but even insulting. And the impact and damage to the environment is directly proportional to economic growth. Worst of all, the logic of economic growth fuels consumerism which deceives promising happiness through material prosperity and acquisition of goods. Our materialistic world, impoverishing humanity and authentic human relations, breeds loneliness, void and despair. The perfect scenario for promising happiness through consumerism, which breeds more loneliness and void, reinforcing a vicious spiral that leads to destruction. The path is refocusing the quest for happiness of the human person on authentic human relationships and on loving and serving our neighbors. 
putting material needs in their subordinate place in our life, seeking simplicity and restraint. Consequently, ordering human activity and business to the service of the real needs of others, and by making space to reciprocity and gift, bringing a more human, loving character to business and market relations. This works for personal satisfaction, happiness, and flourishing, for sustainable, long-term, prosperous businesses, for a sustainable environment, and a life that is worth living. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jose. I, uh, much like the previous presentation, have a number of uh, questions to ask of you, especially in uh, in the context of what we're living today. So look forward to um, questions from our audience as well. Again, on the right-hand side of your uh, go-to um, menu, there's a section for questions, and feel free to to type your question in there. Uh, if you'd like to direct that to one of our specific presenters, please include that in the question. Now, our next presenter is Joanne Green, joining us from London, England. Joanne has been influencing governments, large companies, and global institutions on poverty and environmental challenges for 20 years. She played a leading role in adding a new millennium uh, Millennium Development Goal on Sanitation, persuading the United Kingdom government to significantly increase aid to water, sanitation, and waste management, securing a review of the World Bank's Doing Business Report, and influencing a major multinational to reduce and take responsibility for its plastic waste. She has been an advisor to the United Kingdom government, head of policy for CAFOD, and now co-leads Tier uh, Fund's waste and plastics policy work. Drawing on Tier Fund's experience, Joanne will look at how, as a Christian organization, they have supported entrepreneurs to create green jobs and influence big companies to be more responsible. Thanks for joining us, Joanne. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Firstly, let me give a quick introduction to Tear Fund. Uh, we are a Christian relief and development charity. We are based in the UK and London, but we work in over 50 countries around the world and we celebrated our 50th year last year. And the way that we work is that we work with local churches and church-based organisations in Africa, Asia and Latin America. And we uh, support them with advice, um, with capacity building, and also with funding um, to help them to support um, people in poverty to um, come out of poverty, uh, both spiritual and economic poverty. So that's who Tear Fund is. And um, for many years now, we have been really concerned about the rate and impact of environmental degradation that is affecting the poorest people in our world the hardest those who have often done the least to cause it. Um, so we have become very committed to relief and development that is environmentally and economically sustainable and also reduces the exposure and impact of risk. We believe as Tear Fund that we're called to be stewards of God's creation and we need to find a new way of relating economically to each other and to our world. We clearly can't continue as we are. So we are calling for a restorative economy, which meets three key tests. Firstly, that everyone can meet their basic needs. Secondly, that the world lives within environmental limits. And thirdly, that inequality in its current extremes is no longer accepted. And we work to achieve this at community, national and global level. I want to talk firstly about um, the work that we've been doing in Nigeria, and um, this is more about our sort of local and national work, firstly, and the work that we've been doing to support green entrepreneurs there. So um, in many countries around the world, but also in Nigeria, we um, support local organizations to create green jobs and livelihoods that generate real wealth and income and, and are economically sustainable, crucially, of course, um, we're not specialists in supporting small businesses, 
um, but that's not one of our sort of specialist areas, but we have been mobilizing um, entrepreneurs to create green jobs. And it, you'll probably be aware that in Nigeria, youth unemployment is a huge problem and half of the country's population is, is under the age of 30. And this has been identified as a key challenge is, for, is to find jobs for these young people, who, many of whom are currently unemployed. In, in Tear Fund's Nigeria office, they wanted to find a way to address this issue. Um, and as part of the discussions around climate change that they were having, they decided that they wanted to look at ways of um, turning waste into jobs in particular, because there's a huge amount of waste in Nigeria's urban centres, um, plastic waste, but also e-waste and other types of waste as well. So in 2015, um, the, they started working with a group of young people. And the interesting thing that they've noticed about that is that young people are not set in their ways like adults. They are able to explore and innovate and they are not afraid to fail. And together they set up something called the Joss Green Centre um, in Joss in Nigeria. And this is a centre for eco entrepreneurship. That means businesses based on eco issues, renewable energy or anything that's kind of environmentally friendly. Um, 70 people are now part of the Joss Green Centre and they've also started similar centres in each geopolitical zone of Nigeria, including in the northern area, which is quite insecure. And what they do with the young people is that when they come, they don't just send them straight away to work. Actually, the first thing that they do is to take them through a MICA challenge resource called Live Justly. A MICA challenge is a global organisation, a global campaign um, of, of Christian organisations. And they produce this resource called Live Justly, which is basically a series of Bible studies um, introducing people to the idea of justice and mercy in the Bible. And this actually introduces them to the biblical basis for what they are doing and the importance of advocacy and justice. And it really helps to shape their values because this is not just about jobs. We want to have value driven youth who enable society to function in the way it should. And even before they finish the Live Just Lee course, the young people get really inspired and say that their eyes have been opened. Um, and one of the first things that this, this first group of young people did was that they went to the local government um, after doing this Live Just Lee course and ask them for permission to collect the flexible banners that are used in the streets and make them into plastic shopping bags. Um, and when they showed the officials the products they'd already made, they were given permission immediately. The officials were really impressed and even offered to give the young people space in their office. So early on, they just um, sort of started asking to work with government and um, identified opportunities and things that they could do. And next, they developed an eco innovation hub. And this has been a place where young people can work on green issues and create products. And the government has agreed to give them land and also money for this. And in the words of the youth, the process so far has been a wow experience. They are surprised, but beyond that, they believe they can do something for themselves now. They can be independent and have a voice. One of their most successful projects has just won an award. And this uh, project has provided 50 poor households in Joss with solar electricity by utilising um, electric waste that would otherwise be dumped and become a hazard to the community. The benefits of this project have been immense. Um, E-waste has been removed from the environment. Poor households have been given access to energy and young people have been in trained in how to produce solar power and how to reduce dirty forms of energy like charcoal, diesel and kerosene. Now coming out of this, some of the reflections that we've had is that um, supporting um, individual entrepreneurs seems to work much better than supporting more traditional NGOs to create green jobs. Um, often more traditional NGOs have a very set way of doing a project, which is brilliant for what that is, but they're not so good at thinking in a more of a business way. And by working with people who already have a vision, who already have ideas, um, and supporting them, and um, we found that this works really well. A second thing that we've learned is that it's really important to make sure that you understand the market um, that you're selling into and that there is a market and there is enough of a market, that's crucial. Um, and that this is a really, you know, a huge and challenging area to, to be working in and where we have a lot more learning to do. And we have a lot of resources on our Tier Fund website that's that are designed for people 
in the global south to help them to look at um, how to do uh, how to work in this area more so if you search for tier fund and footsteps you will be able to find a lot more resources and information about this secondly and um, the other area where we've been working is more globally so this is about influencing big business to be responsible we've got a campaign at the moment called the rubbish campaign um, which is targeting four companies um, PepsiCo, Coca-Cola, Unilever and Nestle and asking them to reduce um, the plastic waste that they sell in poorer countries and to collect um, one item for every item that they sell and because we can see that plastic pollution is not just affecting the oceans it's affecting people in poverty as well and um, it's creating health problems because people have no choice but to burn or to dump their rubbish and it ends up um, blocking waterways, creating floods and also attracting the vermin. The other um, big problem it causes is that people inhale smoke from the burning of, um, of, of waste and plastic waste. And this is one of the um, biggest killers of, of people. Um, so this is something that we've been say talking to companies about and saying that there's a really clear moral case um, for them to act on this issue um, you know this is not just their responsibility but they do have a significant responsibility it's often these companies who have um, started selling um, single-use plastics in these countries before others and um, we believe it's vital that they move over to other more refillable and reusable approaches and one of the things that we've learned in getting companies to listen and to change is that media has been really important in helping them to feel the pressure. Um, we did a report last year where we managed to get Sir David Attenborough um, to write the foreword. We got really good media coverage and um, that was really helped by having him involved, but also by having a new, new statistic, which we highlighted about how many people were dying from mismanaged waste and plastic waste. So that was a really key learning point for us um, and we didn't write a research report and then hope to get media off it we wrote a media report and um, so we wrote something specifically for the media that we that we it was written with that audience in mind and I think that's why we were successful um, also with the campaign that we've been doing we've been mobilizing ordinary people to take action ordinary Christians um, in the UK and also around the world um, and we found that's been really successful as well. So we did an action recently where we asked people to um, send a message in a Coca-Cola bottle to ask Coca-Cola to do more to tackle plastic pollution in particular, um, because they're one of the world's top plastic polluters. And we managed to get a meeting um, with them as a result of that campaign action, which we hadn't previously, because obviously Coca-Cola um, are concerned about what um, their customers and consumers think about them. So having ordinary people write to them and tell them that this is a concern of theirs really got them to sort of start to listen to us a bit more. Um, as well as taking this out, what we would call an outsider approach in the campaigning and the media, we're also working behind the scenes with the companies on how they can work with waste pickers um, in the global south. Um, and this is something that um, has become, you know, a really important part of our work. As a Christian agency, we think it's vital that we hold the powerful to account, but we do that in a fair and measured way. And we feel that by doing it in this way, um, by balancing these two things, we've been able to build relationships of trust with the companies. So finally, um, my sort of final reflection really is that in our work, both with small scale entrepreneurs and with much bigger business, um, we want to see models of business that reduce inequality, poverty and puts more into nature than it takes out. And this is going back to the idea of the restorative economy that I talked about in the beginning. We try to do this in a way that supports ordinary people in the church, not experts, to be part of a movement of change in holding the powerful to account whilst also being the change that we want to see through modelling good practice, creativity and entrepreneurship at the grassroots in business. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Such a, a pertinent issue uh, right now with um, what's going on in, in the world and in the global economy this morning. 
uh, here in the United States, I, I read uh, a record number of workers uh, have filed for unemployment, I think close to 3 million. And so uh, I'm looking forward to asking you um, some questions around how do we uh, redirect, you know, during uh, when we get closer to a global recovery, how can we um, seed new green jobs, um, maybe embracing a bit uh, what we heard in the first presentation from, from Dr. Dave about this idea of a, a reformed um, abundant living concept and how we can embrace um, jobs that are uh, more coherent with the circular economy and um, more sensitive to uh, the impacts on the environment. So lots of good things to unpack there. Our next presenter uh, comes to us from Germany, Dr. Peter Nitschke. Um, he is um, uh, a member of uh, Plastic Bank who is sponsoring this webinar. So we'll have an opportunity to uh, hear from him on Plastic Bank. Um, Dr. Peter is the Faith Program Manager at Plastic Bank. He designed and pioneered the program from the beginning with the vision to enliven faith communities to stop ocean plastic and improve livelihoods. Peter has a passion for training and empowering communities. As he wrote his uh, doctoral dissertation on grassroots education, Peter has been working with informal recycling communities for the past 10 years, opening the first plastic bank branch in the Philippines in 2017. Peter has also worked in the Philippines since 1997, where he supported local communities to set up grassroots cooperatives facilitating economic development. Peter has vast experience working with nonprofits in the Philippines, managing projects in 12 provinces with a focus on developing entrepreneurs. Peter now lives in his native Germany. Uh, his presentation will, um, will treat the following. Plastic has become an ever-present part of our lives and we use it all the time. The disposal of plastic is creating severe problems and damages to planet and people. How can we transform our use of plastic by revealing the value of it? How can communities of faith be a force of regeneration to fight ocean plastic and poverty? The Plastic Bank Faith Program is a conduit for change where faith communities can engage, um, creating a powerful impact for people and planet. Thank you for sponsoring this event, uh, Peter and uh, looking forward to hearing from you and, and your presentation now. Thank you so much, Ryan, and thank you to all the others. Wonderful presentations and um, from the much broader perspective that basically you have really laid out a foundation of human flourishing based on the Christian theology and Joanne showing actually how an NGO can um, have a great impact in uh, providing green jobs and also um, influencing the behavior of uh, multinational corporation. Uh, Plastic Bank is um, taking a little bit different approach and uh, I want to zoom in on, on plastic as part of human flourishing or not human flourishing as plastic is ever present in our in our lives and I want also want to talk a bit about what Plastic Bank is doing, what we can personally do, and what uh, congregations also, how congregations can be involved as well. And um, we talk about human flourishing. Uh, by the way, can everybody see my presentation? Can it be seen? Yes, Peter. Good. Um, in the moment, or in many ways, plastic is actually more creating damage than human flourishing, especially in our uh, oceans. Um, the, the rate of plastic disposal into the ocean is uh, shocking. You think about 8 million tons or one dump truck per minute or 400 billion um, bottles, which would be about 
60 bottles per person per year that it, each one of us throws into the ocean. Uh, that is just um, incredible, uh, sad and tragic. And if you continue this way, we will have the same rate of plastic in the ocean uh, as the same rate of fish by by 2050. And so a uh, plastic bank has thought, how can we um, make a difference here? How can this be turned around? And our vision is to, to mobilize 1 billion people to stop ocean plastic. It needs a momentum of people to, to stop that. And our approach is to monetize the, this waste to improve lives. As Joanne just said that the poorest are suffering most from ocean pollution or from plastic pollution. Uh, the sad thing is plas uh, plastic could be actually used also the other way around. There are about uh, 70 million people who live by, by waste picking and they're the poorest of the poor while Recycling is a big business. So how can recycling become a conduit to change the life of the informal waste pickers and become an avenue for them to get out of poverty? So the plastic bank is doing this in a threefold way. Um, the first step is for us to build and activate recycling infrastructure in, in the world's poorest regions. In the moment, we are working in Indonesia, in the Philippines, in Haiti, in Brazil, and in Egypt. We have collected almost um, 10 million kilos of plastic. We have about uh, almost 300 collection points with 18,000 active members who collect plastic. and. So people come to our spots, our collection points, and they bring the plastic. And through our blockchain application, they get bonuses, they get cash, and um, they get a fair wage for people uh, to get uh, to improve their lives. And that plastic then is also not only giving um, them income; we are also providing healthcare coverage school tuition uh, and other services. And so we are saying these uh, informal waste speakers, they are people who take care of the environment. So they should be rewarded. They should be incentivized. They should live in human dignity because what they're doing is a great service um, to, to humanity. And so we want to put them into the center of um, our movement and the plastic that is being collected then is sold as a kind of a fair trade feedstock back into the industry. And so we are closing the loop in a circular economical um, model with the goal that plastic becomes too valuable to be thrown away. That people say, no, plastic is a, not trash. It is a resource and must be used like what we heard earlier in God's economy, there is no waste. If you look at nature, there is no waste. Everything is being used and transformed. And we believe that the same should be happening with plastic as well. So we can um, display this principle of God's economy also in what we are doing. Uh, but uh, we also uh, want to engage every individual in changing their own behavior as far as plastic consumption is concerned. And uh, the model that we are advocating for is the five R approach. And the first R is to rethink, to evaluate your consumption pattern. For example, instead of buying an apple juice that is sugar, that is in a packaging, why just don't eat an apple? It's healthier and there, and it's already it comes in natural packaging and um, packaging that you can even eat. So much better to eat an apple, right? Or to refuse. Um, so there are plastics uh, that are non-recyclable, like multi-layer sachets. So refuse using those because they can only be either go to landfill or they go to incineration or they go into the ocean. So better not to use them 
at all. Then the third R is to reduce, uh, reducing our plastic footprint, reusing single use plastic. Actually, the, all the plastic that we have been producing over since the 50s, it's all still there. And as we move on, uh, plastic production will be still increasing. And I think we should be reducing the plastic that we are consuming. Um, we can also reuse a lot of plastic. We can be creative, like using plastic uh, basins as flower pots or, or bottles as pencil holders. And there are a lot of handicrafts ideas in the internet of how you can reuse plastic. And finally, what Plastic Bank is doing as their business is recycling plastic. If we think about that only 9% of all the plastic that is being produced globally is recycled, then um, I think there is still a lot of space to um, recycle plastic and to increase this recycling rate. Um, imagine that right now about 15% of the global fuel industry is producing new and new plastic while we are not recycling the plastic that we already have produced. So I think there really needs to happen something magnificent or to change that. Now, um, how can uh, congregations come in to the, the picture? And I think that uh, there is really a theological foundation of caring for creation, of living in shalom. And I think it's also something that we as Christians or believers of what the religion so Eva, what unites us is also that we all use plastic. So instead of just using an individual approach, I think also as a congregation, we should be doing something. And I want to share a little bit about the, the faith program that the Plastic Bank has started. And we have uh, two models. And first is for congregation in the global south, where there is often lots of mismanaged plastic just on the streets in the in the small rivers, it, we have created a program to mobilize um, church communities to set up collection points and to train uh, the parishioners. We have sermons and Bible studies, like in this manual. We even will be launching an online learning platform on Monday uh, where faith leaders can download the training and we are now operating this um, program in Indonesia, in the Philippines, and in Brazil, and in Haiti. Uh, we are now even starting a partnership with Steer Fund to collect uh, plastic from churches and Christian schools. So we are envisioning that this program will be having a significant impact with, with thousands of congregations becoming part of this. And imagine what impact that would make if if we all would be part of this. And for the global north, where mostly plastic is being already collected, we have a program that is being called Become Plastic Positive. If you go to our website, we have a plastic footprint calculator. So you can, it gives you a number of questions. You can calculate your personal plastic footprint and you can, uh, contribute to become plastic positive. We also have in our manual um, waste um, evaluation that as a congregation or as a school, you can go through your rubbish and you can uh, see what kind of waste you are producing, how much plastic you are producing. You can look what kind of plus waste reduction strategies as a church you can uh, implement and also as a church how you can also um, become plastic uh, positive by contributing to our campaign what we're doing is or planning is to set up congregations from the global north partnering with congregation in the global south we are now working one of those out in Germany with one diocese partnering with another diocese in the Philippines to, to set up 
um, recycling infrastructure in the Philippines and to stop ocean plastic in that particular region also together with the local government. So um, I think there is a lot really we could uh, do as, as believers to make a difference in this. And um, what I think we need is awareness and, and, and training. And I just wanted to put up some of the trainings that are uh, available and especially also um, our partners who are also joining us on this webinar. They have also created wonderful material like the Arocha has this Echo Church program and here is the link. They have wonderful training material that you can use. Um, we also have uh, from the Catholic side, you have the Laudato Si that is celebrating its fifth anniversary uh, this year and they have launched the Laudato Si week where they have lot week where they have lot of resources and activities where where which you can join and, and that's a really a wonderful resource as well. Uh, what Joanne said, Tier Fund has put up um, tremendous material um, in their website. And here's a link, especially to the particular publication about the circular economy, where economy can be flourishing, where economy can uh, be running after the principles of God. And that is a wonderful thing you can download. And then, of course, our own Plastic Bank Faith website with the, our online learning platform that is launching this coming Monday. So while you are in quarantine and you're at home and you're, you, you are, I think, uh, have now the great opportunity to browse through all this wonderful material and get inspired and learn a lot. And as soon as this Corona thing is over, you can go out and you can change the world together with us and in that way you can be part of the solution and not any more of the pollution. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter, for the presentation. Very inspiring to see so many practical applications uh, that Plastic Bank has put together uh, to respond to the great challenge of enlivening uh, uh, faith-based communities. You know, this is something too um, that um, that we've seen. Peter is um, care for our common home, stewardship of creation, is something that all faiths really share. It's something that um, can bring uh, can bridge the divide between different faiths. And bring people together. And I think, uh, you know, as we're fighting this pandemic together, which um, doesn't discriminate when it uh, infects us, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what color we are, what faith we are, we're all kind of fighting this thing together. And in a similar way, uh, we all share a common uh, desire to, to steward the uh, steward creation better. And so I think um, you know what Plastic Bank has put together under your uh, guidance is really an impressive response to that. So I want to thank you for that. We've got a number of um, we've got a number of questions from folks that have joined the webinar, and I, I've I've tried to uh, order these. Um, a couple of general questions to to kick things off, and then we'll get into some specifics. Um, a general question, in, in which ways might the corona crisis help our societies to deal with the climate crisis and loss of biodiversity? And this is a question for, for anyone that would like to respond on the panel. Actually, uh, as I'm on, my microphone is on, I can say maybe uh, just a little bit. Uh, it seems right now it's giving us a breather and we see like in Manila, the air is clean, suddenly the smoke is gone. Um, we see uh, dolphins back in in the channels of Venice. And But um, the fear is that as soon as the quarantine is over, that uh, especially um, without a, a renewed mindset, 
um, production might just be kicking in and uh, it might even get worse because um, companies are might be trying to catch up and reduce even more and and so the the thing that we really need in this time is really to to see how we can advocate uh, for a different um, economic model that we're not just going back to to what we had before but then we realize we we really need to change um, significantly into a different uh, regenerative model where where we uh, have our economical activities in line with what our planet also needs um thanks if, if i might add to so joanne here um i think you know it's really important to be sensitive to the current situation and, and the suffering that many people are going through um but it is also vital that I think we build back better from this crisis. And I think if this crisis is teaching us anything, it's the importance to be thinking long term um, and to be strategic. And I think often as um, economies and, and governments, they haven't always thought for the long term. And I think, you know, we're seeing now just in my own country that, you know, the health care system has been under invested in for many years. Um, and um, you know, when a crisis hits, we, we actually need to be resilient and we need to be able to um, deal with that crisis. And I think this shows that, um, and, and lots of people are arguing, like Paul Polman from Unilever has been arguing that this crisis shows we need to be strategic, we need to be long-term. And, and obviously there have been concerns raised that, that um, the more that we interfere with nature, the more likely we are to see these types of pandemics and and our resilience to deal with them will be reduced um, because we'll also have climate change to deal with as well. Um, I think what we are seeing is obviously a, a huge potential global economic impact. And I think the oil and gas sectors are at the front of that. They are already very weak, um, very much weakened. Um, and I think they, they will be hit hard by this. Um, fracking is another industry which is extremely vulnerable because it's very leveraged, it's very indebted. So that is another industry that is vulnerable. And and obviously, you know, some of those industries are, well, many of those industries are ones that people are concerned about as contributing to climate change. Um, so I, I think the critical thing is that those industries are not bailed out, but that instead that money is spent on investing in green jobs, both in the global north and in the global south. I, I agree strongly with what Joanne's just said there. And, and I think I mean, in terms of what we can learn from this, um, the global response to the pandemic has, has demonstrated that firstly, human behavior, the behavior of whole societies can change dramatically and quickly when it needs to. Um, and secondly, that economies can be changed dramatically and quickly when they need to. Uh, I mean, suddenly universal human basic wage, instead of becoming something that one or two countries are talking about, is something that is becoming, uh, in, in certainly many countries, something that's actually suddenly being implemented. Um, we can actually measure how our economies and how our societies are able to do with far less travel, with more homeworking, with less consumerism, with less consumption of all but basic foodstuffs. Um, we've got data now to look at this, and I think we can we can really look at a different kind of economic model um, very sensibly. I, I, I see it's been proposed that we need not only national responses, but we need an international global leadership response. Um, to this, much as when um, the G20 um, bailed out uh, a lot of the world's poorest countries and cancelled a lot of debt back 15, 20 years ago. We now need a way in which not just the G20, but representatives of the medium and lower income countries come together to say what kind of world do we want to rebuild from here. Um, and as, as several of us have said, we need an economic system that is much more about valuing relationships um, and that includes our relationship with the global poor, our relationships globally, but also our relationship with nature. 
um, that does not see nature as an externality that you can just exploit ad infinitum. So there's an awful lot we can gain from this, I think. I want to um, jump in here and paraphrase a few questions that have been asked into one. Um, in some of the presentations, uh, there was reference made to consumerism and materialism. Um, there are segments of uh, the Christian faith that promote a type of prosperity uh, gospel, and prosperity is often defined as um, material prosperity or um, wealth accumulation prosperity. Um, in what ways do you think, and this is an open question, do you think uh, Christian uh, denominations and the Christian church in general um, needs to reevaluate uh, this idea of prosperity um, to have what I, maybe a more coherent uh, application of stewardship of creation? Actually, the psalmist was praying, give me neither wealth nor poverty. Uh, and I think that was a word of, uh, of wisdom. And uh, also Paul writes that the love of money is one root of all kinds of, of evil. And, and I think that what Dave said also that um, having uh, to think what we really need and, uh, and uh, look not our happiness into in material things but in relationships i think that's the essence really of the gospel and also the the whole concept of shalom uh, is also um uh, part of this and i think especially looking at shalom with it looks at the well-being of the whole creation would be probably a much better model of com of defining prosperity or, or let's say well-being or human flourishing. I think those are even better terms than prosperity. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking that something that is key is uh, helping people refocus on what makes them truly happy. I think that the uh, gospel of prosperity is actually playing for the, I mean, to the to the common culture and not really to the gospel. And it's deceiving because consumerism, it's like a quick fix that makes you happy for a moment, but you it's like any addiction. You always see more and more and more. And that's not the way of, uh, of, uh, of happiness. Rather, whatever resources should be uh, channeled into serving the poor, serving those in need and giving us purpose and that purpose gives satisfaction and helps flourishing. Uh, Dr. Jose, I'd like to follow up um, with you on a question. Um, you know, in the in the in the Christian uh, in Christian theology, we talk often about um, when sin entered the world through Adam and Eve, ruptures were created between the human person and God and the human person and themselves. Um, you know, we're living in a time of where uh, about half the world is, is, is quarantined, unprecedented in modern times. In what ways do you think it's important from a faith perspective for people to slow down maybe to get uh, more in touch with themselves and the re their relationship with God in order to, um, like in your presentation spoke about, go out into business, go out into creation and heal some of those wounds? Well, <clears throat> I, I think that the, the, the key element there is how the relationship with God will help you recognize that uh, the purpose you have in life is is to love, to love God, to love yourself, to love others and serve. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't always happen so easily. I mean, many people in, in our materialistic uh, culture are basically shut off from God. And so I hope that 
this event of the quarantine might help people revalue their family relationships, revalue friendship, revalue how to connect with each other and fill this void, not with consumerism or experiences, which are out of the, a little bit restricted right now, but rather with authentic relationships. I, I think that's, that's the path to re rediscover who you are and eventually that can lead you back to yourself and God. But, um, but it, it's a challenge. It's not going to, uh, I mean, it's not going to happen easily. Uh, we, there's a whole culture that has led us in a different way. Something we see when we take mission uh, groups of uh, college students from the Europe and the United States to South America, is the shock that they see that people can be happy without all the material things that they take for granted. But it's an experience that they need to live through. It, I mean, in theory, theory doesn't help much to, to have people recognize that. like to um, redirect to Joanne, if, if, if I could. Um, taking the experience, um, let's say, the, the personal experience of encountering oneself, re-encountering God during this time, and taking that practically after the quarantine. Um, I mentioned earlier that um, you know a record number of folks in the United States uh, have uh, applied for un. Uh, um, unemployment uh, insurance. This is something we're seeing around the world um, with massive numbers of people unable to um, to earn a, a living during the quarantine. As we move into uh, the future, as we pass this 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 hurdle of of the crisis and the quarantine, Joanne, do you have any thoughts on how governments, how individuals um, might be able to repurpose their their careers, their work around um, more sustainable work, creating green jobs? Do you have any tips, any advice, any insight into um, how we might be able to take this reboot, if you will, and make it uh, a step, many steps forward for uh, authentic living and for, um, let's say, a, a greater care for our common home? Mm. I, th I think people are going to understandably feel um, very exposed to sort of starting new businesses after this um, and and obviously but you know at the same time that there, there will be a need for that um, and I think it's really vital that governments send really clear signals um, around the types of economy that that we want to build back um, and governments, as we've seen in this crisis, you know, the government is, is back in a big way. Um, government has ceded a lot of control to, to the market. And I think what this crisis has seen is that it's so important that we have the right sort of government intervention and the right sort of incentives from government to create green jobs. And that can be done through tax. It can be done through subsidies and it can be done through legislation and policies as well. And we've seen that with renewable energy, when renewable energy in the early days, that sort of new technology was supported to get to a place where, where the cost could be reduced quite substantially. And now it's really competing um, very successfully with um, more traditional types of energy. And I think that sort of model is, is something that governments uh, should learn from and should um, sort of adopt more widely uh, as we move through this crisis um, and I think as I said before it's really important that you know money isn't used to bail out polluting heavily po polluting industries and instead is invested in um, as well as um, providing fiscal incentives also providing finance and loans um, for green businesses as well so I think those are some of the things that can be done but on Tier Fund's website, um, we, on, as I said earlier, on Tier Fund uh, Footsteps website, we've got a lot of resources for um, people in the Global South, particularly, um, to help them how to um, set up businesses, how to sort of understand the market, how to do market research, and really look at um, making sure that the sort of your business idea is tested and, and workable. 
um, and will, um, you know, lots of ideas for how you can be sort of as sustainable and, and successful as possible. Good, jo thank you, Joanne. I've got a, a question for uh, the general group here. Um, in light of the current global lockdown, there's a lot of talk about key or essential services. Is there an opportunity here to redefine what we consider to be essential services and to truly value the people who provide those services? And uh, I think this is an interesting question I've seen on social media, um, uh, memes and depictions of people that we often take for granted, whether they be our medical uh, doctors and nurses and administrative staff, whether it be the folks that work in supermarkets, whether it be the postal service, um, a lot of a lot of people um, that we take for granted are now the heroes of this moment. So just kind of curious uh, what the thoughts are of the panel on our ability as a people, as a society, to revalue um, these services, these people, or is this just a fleeting moment in which uh, in a couple of months we'll go back to normal or go back to what we've been accustomed to rather? Yeah, I mean, I, I just, sorry, I just spoke, but I'll just say something quickly on this because it was, I was going to add it on to what I said previously, as I think that um, investing in key public services, it, it not just sort of investing in green technology, but investing in, in key public services needs to be a, a major plank and strategy for governments going forward. Um, you know, the, a lot of these, as well as being vital for addressing inequality and poverty for people, um, you know, this is also vital they, these are also potentially low carbon like the so social care health care child care are all very easily decarbonized as well so i think you know investing in public services and valuing public service wo workers and paying them a fair wage and making sure they've got the right equipment potentially meets so many different objectives um in terms of creating jobs creating green jobs and also um you know, ensuring that people can access good public services um, at all times, but especially when crises like these hit. Yes, if I may, uh, I think there are a couple of things like uh, what Joanne has said about valuing uh, public services. And right now we're recognizing that our public service infrastructure is weak to deal with a crisis. We are not so resilient to be able to overcome these challenges. So that, in a way, is something that needs to be reevaluated and uh, value more the, those people who are normally not, not well rewarded for the service they provide. That's one thing. Another thing is that uh, our globalization has shown that it's not all it's suited for. I mean, uh, global supply chains are very, very vulnerable to something like this. So we need to think more also of how we reinforce our local suppliers. I mean, to be able to buy locally, to be able to source not only our food, but in general, many things that are basic needs locally, even though it might not be, uh, I mean, it might be a little more costly in some events, but in other ways, it leaves us less vulnerable. And <clears throat> I'm, I see these opportunities, but there's also something that we need to be very aware of that right now, mm -hmm. the financial system is very strained and it's gonna get worse and worse. So uh, many businesses and many governments are thinking, okay, how do we overcome this? How do we re and that recovery is basically predicated on recovering economic growth, which is one of the reasons that we're in the predicament we're in right now. So we'll need to be able, we'll need to have elements to counteract that drive to to become uh, bigger and bigger economically again to repair our economy. I mean that's not the, that's not the way to go, but it will be a strong challenge. 
All right, we have time here for, I think, one last question. Um, before I ask it, I've, I've received some questions about uh, the first presentation, um, which was cut off by, by Dave here. We uh, will make this recording available, and uh, we do have plans to re-record Dave's presentation, um, and we'll package that together um, in this uh, webinar, and um, we'll uh, send that out as an email to all of those that were invited. So rest assured that we'll get the, the full presentation from Dave up um, and included. And there are questions that we won't be able to get to. I, I, I see a few folks here that uh, gave their contact information to some of our presenters with very specific questions. So we'll pass those along and uh, hopefully get a response uh, to you. Uh, final question here um, for, uh, for Peter. I mentioned earlier, um, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to close with a, a personal question on my end. Um, during this quarantine, I have to admit that I've taken my own recycling, my own conservation, and even uh, stewardship of creation to a new level. And I think, you know, in a crisis of um, of uh, you know being quarantined, potentially looking around and seeing okay, these are the resources I need to live with for X amount of time. That tin can uh, that you ate, um, you know, that you got your spaghetti sauce out of, all of a sudden becomes, uh, in my case here, a pot for a plant. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we're feeling a bit more connected. I think, you know, we're, we're probably going to go through quite a bit more um, of, of time and quarantine before this passes. But my question to you, Peter, is what advice do you have for our faith leaders to encourage a deeper introspection into the faithful's lives and um, for a more co coherent application of um, you know, a, a better stewardship of, of creation? Specifically, what can faith leaders do, pastors, priests, uh, lay people who um, our leaders and faith communities to really enliven uh, the faithful to, to take on this challenge? Well, that is a, a good question. I think faith leaders have now a lot of different challenges that they are, are facing in, 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 in looking after, after the people who, who they uh, care for spiritually and, and to nurture them and even to keep the life of, of the parish or or the congregation up through online church and, and things like 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 this and um, and I think um, first of all it is important to uh, to give hope to people but also uh, to encourage them uh, to use this time that they that they have um, in a in a wise way, and 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 that is maybe a good way to to maybe start backyard gardening and using recycling or using plastic containers that were just laying around and that maybe otherwise you maybe just have thrown away. And, and as in in Europe and in the northern hemisphere, we have now spring. Now this is a good time, maybe for such kind of. Um, activities but on the other hand i think it is also important to think uh, or to prepare people for the time after the quarantine is over of course many people will be um, just holding on to their lives and seeing how can they restore just their livelihood their basic income like also what we see in um, in the philippines there are so many people who are on daily wages and but then there is also the thing that um, we can uh, maybe use this recyclable plastic also as a as a source of of income to one uh, for those congregations as well. So I think there are different ways. So I think for it is for for clergy or church leaders important to get informed and to become aware and to pass it on as multiply multiplicators. 
Thank you, Peter. And I want to thank all of our uh, guests, uh, all of those that have joined us. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of the questions. Um, thank you to uh, to Dave, to Joanne. Thank you for to Jose, uh, to Peter, um, and and thank you uh, to all of those that joined us on our uh, webinar here, Faith in a Regenerative Economy, Doing Business for the Benefit of People and Planet. As I mentioned before, we are um, going to provide um, the presentation of uh, that Dave gave. Uh, we'll re-record and, um, and, and cut that, um, that portion out and put in the, the new uh, recording of his presentation. We'll make that available to all of you. We'll send an email. And if you have any other questions um, that you would like our presenters to respond to, please send it into the um, the uh, Go Meeting question area, and I will get those questions to our presenters. Thank you again, and um, why don't we just end in in prayer now? Dear Lord, we we give you thanks for this opportunity to reflect. Um, and, and deepen in this idea of faith and a regenerative economy. We ask for your blessings on all of us. We ask that you um, put an end to this coronavirus, that you protect all of us, that you restore health to those that are sick and dying. To all of those that are um, at the point of death, we ask that you welcome them into the next life. We ask, Lord, that you also inspire in all of us um, to be better stewards of creation. We ask that you awaken in us the desire to be reconciled to you, to ourselves, to our brothers and sisters, to establish more authentic relationships, to give us the courage to go out and to create new jobs that are more coherent with our call to be stewards of the environment and um, to lead others on this path as well. So we entrust all of this to you. We entrust all of the intentions in our heart. And we ask you to bless us and care for us. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Brian, for moderating. And Thanks, thank you guys. All of you. God bless. Be safe.